Okay, so chapter 20, abdominal gastrointestinal emergencies. While there aren't necessarily a lot that we're going to be able to do for these, and I know I seem to say that a lot in this section, um, simply because a lot of these conditions require interventions far beyond what we're capable of in the pre-hospital environment. Excuse me. The there are a number of conditions associated with gastrointestinal and abdominal emergencies that can be life-threatening. Though they're normally boil down to, typically they're going to boil down to two conditions. One that results in internal bleeding or the other that results in a significant internal infe um, infection like sepsis or something. There are conditions, you know, as you can see here on like irritable bowel and such like that, that resent, result in uh, dehydration but or alterations of nutrition, but that's kind of a longer term, slower process. The other one that's generally pretty concerning is liver disorders because they lead to uh, chemical imbalances in your blood. Your liver is what's responsible for removing most of the toxins from your blood and bio, the biometabolism and conversion of uh, chemicals so that they can be excreted through the kidneys typically. So when you have liver failure or liver related issues, you start having a buildup of those toxins and such like that. It can result in um, some pretty rapidly uh, concerning conditions or conditions that develop rapidly and are very concerning. Sorry. So um, yeah. Oops, went too far. All right. There we go. All right. So here are some characteristic, or excuse me, here are some behaviors that increase your risk factors or increase your risk of um, GI associated conditions. Um, so low fiber diet, like we eat in EMS, alcohol, like we drink in EMS, smoking, like a lot of people do in EMS, um, insert, ingestion of certain medications, you know, like al Tylenol and ibuprofen for our back pain that we do in EMS and uh, stress like we have in EMS. So, um, oh, and look at that. Uh, well, I guess we don't really, we don't really drink acid, although some of us probably thought about it at time her. But um, yeah. <clears throat> so eight to 72 hours is the way things are supposed to work through our giant donut that we call a body. Remember, the GI tract is just one long continuous hole from mouth to anus, so we are, in a sense, a donut. So, um, remember your anatomy, your regions, we kind of went over this a little bit earlier with our trauma, so left upper quadrant, you're going to have your spleen, stomach, and part of the pancreas, which would, pancreas is truly retroperitoneal though. Right upper quadrant, you're going to have your liver, your gallbladder, and again, part of your stomach. And then you have your lower quadrants where your left, uh, right lower is going to be your appendix, your ascending colon. Um, of course, your small bowel and is going to be throughout the entire transverse colons in your upper quadrants. Descending colon is in the left lower quadrant. And the then the pelvic region is going to have your bladder, your um, rectum, and for women, the uterus. Not going to get into digestion very much. I tell you what, though, if you like chemistry at all, like if you're at all interested in that kind of stuff, the GI tract and digestion is incredibly interesting when it comes when you're looking at from a chemical standpoint. From EMS, not a big deal, but from a chemistry standpoint, you can nerd out on the GI tract. <clears throat> but we're gonna move past that. I'm not gonna nerd out on you today. All right. Um, this is one of the things that I laugh about the most when people start talking about, well, you can't eat, uh, don't drink Coke. Oh wait, I can't show you a uh, copyrighted. Yeah, sorry. Can Don't drink Coke. Do you know how much acid's in Coke? I'm like, do you know how much acid is in your stomach? Um, It's not your stomach or your GI tract that we're worried about when you drink Coke and the acid in Coke. So yeah, um, <clears throat> kind of, your body makes hydrochloric acid and you don't get much t stronger than that. All right. Um, so moving fat past that. 
Uh, I'm trying really hard not to nerd on these things because it's interesting stuff here. All right. <clears throat> now, an interesting thing to note is the pancreas, which is behind the stomach, secretes enzymes. They're actually um, proenzymes. They're not uh, they're not fully functional enzymes yet, but it secretes enzymes through the common bile, um, through the pancreatic duct, joins with the common bile duct coming out of the liver, and goes into the duodenum, the first portion of the um, small intestines at the end of the stomach. These enzymes are what are used to break down the proteins that we consume and the carbs. So proteins and carbs break down on it predominantly. Various proteins or carbs will have different enzymes required. Why is this important? Well, the majority of the body uh, tissues are made of proteins or carbs. Now, there's also fats and other things, but most cells are going to have a large majority of proteins and carbs in them. And so, these enzymes that the pancreas can produce, <clears throat> when when they come in contact with other body tissues that they aren't intended to, they can cause what's considered auto-digestion. They can start to damage the body, resulting in inflammation and um, irritation and such like that. So one of the things we're going to look for and be aware of is that possibility that um, of pancreatitis or uh, blocked bile ducts or pancreatic ducts and all that, and considering the the issues that pancreatic juices can result, can cause. All right. Um, so we know about the liver. What does the liver do? Well, it uses the leftover pieces of hemoglobin, or basically the byproducts of the hemoglobin metabolism, to produce liver, um, bile. And bile is turned into what's called bile salts, and they emulsify fats. They are what ca cause us to be able to consume fats. Bile is being produced all the time by the liver, and it is stored in a container called the gallbladder. The gallbladder. Um, starts to build up a quantity of bile so that when you eat a fatty food or fatty meal, that bile can be released into your small intestines and the fats be emulsified from it. <clears throat> it's going to be significant as we look at gallbladder attacks and cholecystitis and things like that. Um, this is why uh, this storage process can also result in the production of gallstones, which we'll look at shortly. All right. so. Um, the liver does play a big role in the production of, or excuse me, in the metabolism of carbohydrates, um, mostly because the liver is what will control whether we need or don't need more carbohydrates in, um, in that sense. The cytochrome P450 system that we will see in a little bit about the liver, this is how chemicals, these are how toxins are metabolized and removed from the blood by the liver, where basically they are turned from harmful substances into uh, less harmful substances or inert substances that can be removed from the body. Um, how that system works is not necessary for you to, or important for you to fully understand, but it, know the name cytochrome P450 or the P450 system. That is the primary system or a pathway of detoxification that the liver uses. All right. Um, <clears throat> It says it completes the breakdown of dead red blood cells. So red blood cells go to the spleen to be um, processed when they're dying or when they're at the end of their life, and they get broken down by the spleen. The hemoglobin gets processed and transferred from the spleen to the liver, and the liver breaks down the hemoglobin. So that's um, it's not whole red blood cells going to the liver to be removed. That's, it's just the hemoglobin. All right, now the portal vein. The portal vein plays a huge role in the GI tract and the body in general. So, so we know that you have the stomach, the small intestines, and then goes into the large intestine and the whole process there. So let me uh, pull this up real quick. There we go. All right. So, you know, you got the mouth, right? Comes down to the stomach. 
which empties into the small intestines. And I'm not going to draw them to the extreme. And then that goes to the large intestine like this. All right, which comes there. So everybody knows what's going on here, right? So you can see the um, the GI tract. Now, where does all of this, <clears throat> all of this system here that we can see is responsible for the absorption of nutrients. And that's pulling nutrients out of our food and putting it into our bloodstream. So surrounding all of this, are a bunch of blood capillaries. Everything here is surrounded by capillaries. And for the most part, you know, they're everywhere down here. Here at the small intestine and for a portion of the large intestine, all of these capillaries come together through the mesenteric veins into one primary vein, and that is the portal vein. And for some crazy reason that I honestly don't understand or could, can't explain, that portal vein wraps itself around the esophagus and then enters the liver. And the liver would sit posteriorly right here, essentially, right? So that's where the liver sits back there. Well, technically it's anterior to the rest of those organs. So, sorry. There you go. And that portal vein is what is wrapped around the esophagus and enters the liver. This means that everything absorbed in these vessels, in these capillaries from the GI tract, will go straight to the liver before the liver sends it to any other part of the body. Is that making sense? You following me? The fact that it wraps around the esophagus will be important here in a little bit. So I want you to have that picture in mind as we move through here because that is significant to how our, uh, to some of the conditions that we're going to be looking at. All right. All right, made comment, uh, showed the colon in here, the large intestine, large bowel. Those are all names for the same organ. The primary function of the colon is to not absorb nutrients, but to reabsorb the water out of our uh, chyme and creating feces. So chyme is the stuff that leaves the stomach. So we eat food, goes into our stomach, uh, we start the digestive process. It turns into chyme where it is then placed into the small intestines and goes through the breakdown from enzymes and such like that, and then enters the large bowel or the large intestine. The colon. When it's in the colon, the water is pulled back out of that and the chyme is converted into fecal matter that we can then pass as waste. So one of the things that are a primary ingredient of the chyme that enters the large bowel, the colon, is um, insoluble fibers or non-digestible fiber uh, from a dietary fiber in, in like vegetables and various green plants. Chlorophyll, you know, the chloroplasts, the things that make plants green, are one of the most common objects there. This, um, this form of carbohydrate, which is a uh, polysaccharide, it's a long chain carbohydrates, uh, just kind of like, glu like glycogen and such like that, cannot be broken down by the human body. The human body does not produce, the pancreas does not produce appropriate enzymes to break it apart. And so it stays undigested and enters the large bowel. The large bowel or the colon is where bacteria flora, you know, the bacteria colony lives. And that bacteria can break down that uh, fiber, dissolving it, assisting with the digestion, uh, facilitating its passage. Some nutrients are going to be absorbed through the uh, like uh, vitamins and such like that will be absorbed through the water transfer and reabsorption as well as certain minerals like potassium, sodium, and things. They will get absorbed out of that uh, uh, stool so as it passes through the colon. 
but it isn't really where an area of true absorption uh, or uh, nutrient absorption comes from. It's mostly water absorption there. Uh, but the byproduct of that bacterial uh, colony is going to be uh, methane, sulfur, uh, um, hydrogen sulfide, and um, or not sulfide, um, sulfur, as well as. Um, uh, well, some CO2 and things like that. And that's where flatulence comes from. So it's actually the inability of the human body to break down most dietary fibers and then um, the bacteria colony doing that for us. That bacteria colony is important because of a certain balance of the types of bacteria in there. We're going to see later where imbalances in that uh, can create some significant issues for our patients. So I'm not nerding out here. This has... Uh, it is applicable to what we're going over here. So, all right. When we're going to assess a patient who has GI complaints, generally these GI complaints are not presenting concerns for airway breathing and circulation. So our primary assessment is generally complete in a matter of seconds as we lay eyes on the patient because that's not where our real concern is. They're complaining of abdominal pain or some other form of GI distress. So. We're going to focus our attention in that direction as a more focused assessment. Here are some questions that you need to have, right? Are you in pain? What kind of pain is it? What does it feel like? Where is it located? When did it start? Did it start um, at maximum or did it begin gradually? Does it come and go? Um, do you have any diarrhea, vomiting, anything like that? What have you eaten? What do you normally eat? What has changed in your dietary habits over the last few days? That kind of stuff. All right, so, yeah, well, sometimes we need more than gowns and masks. Um, I've been on a few C. diff calls where we were pretty much just wanted to have a, a full Tyvek suit and uh, SCBA. Um, while we may not have the appropriate or necessary tools to clean our patients thoroughly in the pre-hospital environment, using what we have available to us, whether that be some towels or sheets or something like that, is a definitely an important process. We should clean them as much as possible prior to transport. Um, I realize most of us don't carry the uh, appropriate tools for doing a complete clean on the patient. All right, um, we already kind of talked about this and this and this and this and this. Okay, so here was some of the questions in addition to, you know, your general history about pain or whatever, or their diet, what change have they had in their uh, bowel movements, color consistency, frequency, that kind of stuff. Weight loss plays a big role, and that would be an important question, both weight loss or weight gain, because... Um, Oftentimes we'll find that associated with these conditions, we're dealing with uh, fluid retention or fluid loss. And rapid weight gain or rapid weight loss are most often caused by a change in body fluids, retention or loss. Um, 2.2 pounds is equivalent to one kilogram. One kilogram is equivalent to one liter of water or two pints of blood or two units of blood. So, um, paying attention to have they started gaining weight over the last few days or the last day or so that can play a that can be a big indicator is are we dealing with a renal problem or hepatic issues or something like that all right so when we go to our secondary assessment we're going to start evaluating this patient for a um Sur history of surgery. Do we have scars? Have they had abdominal issues before? Here we see an example of stretch marks called striae. Stretch marks come from a rapidly expanding abdomen um, or tissue, not abdomen, but just in this case it was abdomen, but in tissue in general. So this is why they show up during pregnancy. This is why they show up very commonly in patients who develop um, fluid retention of some sort, whether that's from liver failure and abdominal assessment or renal failure or renal issues and uh, you know dependent edema so um, 
you know, uh, pedal edema, sacral edema, and all that, where their legs start stretch, skin on their legs starts stretching. This can result in um, stretch marks like this. Uh, while I look at this, and you could be like, well, this patient may have been pregnant at one point in time. If this is a man, they wouldn't have those types of striae. So you would consider the possibility of edema associated with. Um, uh, ascites, sorry. While uh, common weight gain and body fat or um, the uh, uh, development of body fat and all that can result in striae, it does not normally result in striae to this significance. The significance and size of the stretch marks will indicate how rapid that body weight gain was. And so you are going to want to suspect things like fluid retention over um, it being associated with just um, the addition of body fat. <laughs> All right. Um, asymmetry. So monitor that. So tumors. Uh, I've seen patients who had um, ovarian cysts and ovarian uh, tumors or other form other abdominal tumors that were so large it made them look pregnant. But it was a notable because, or it was distinguishable from pregnancy. Well, multiple reasons, but it was asymmetrical. It, pregnancy tends to be very symmetrical and centered. But uh, hernias are another thing we'll look at here shortly. Um, this is a <laughs> this is a very bad example or explanation of abdominal um, shapes and all that kind of stuff. I, when you're dealing with a distension, it is more important to take note of how uh, stretched the skin is across the abdomen, especially when they're laying flat on their back, and how tight is that skin, um, more so than just the shape. Um, so. Bowel sounds. While some people are a fan and think that they're very important for the pre-hospital environment, they have very small significance simply because um, it's not going to impact our care very much. If we're suspecting the patient to have a bowel obstruction of some sort, they may have diminished bowel sounds. So you listen for bowel sounds and you're like, oh, they're absent. But notice it says no bowel sounds after continuous auscultation for two minutes. But it doesn't say here, but it's per quadrant. Two minutes. Some places say even three to five minutes per quadrant. We're not going to spend that much time just sitting there listening to bowel sounds to say, yep, it's absent. Don't worry about it. Does, you know, you could say, well, I don't hear anything, so they're diminished. Call it good. Don't sit there and wait and say, well, they're absent. It's irrelevant and not useful. Um, not going to help us in any way. Um, also, if you place a stethoscope on the patient's abdomen and you listen for, and you hear a bowel sound anywhere, you hear it in one quadrant, there's bowel sounds. No need to sit there and wonder, well, do I have them in all quadrants? We're not trying to identify the location of a uh, obstruction or something, so just move on. You've got bowel sounds. All right, cool, move on. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is bowel sounds if you intend to auscultate if you're suspecting a uh, constipation or bowel obstruction or something like that or paralytic ileus meaning they you know they've taken too many um laxatives or something and now they can't move their bowels if you're suspecting one of those concerns listen for bowel sounds before you touch their abdomen all right. This is one of the few times that you're going to auscultate before palpating. You may inspect, but then you auscultate and then you palpate because palpation can stimulate some movement. So while they had a um, decreased bowel sounds, palpation may stimulate it enough to get something moving and then you would kind of have a false positive. So always auscultate before palpating bowel sounds. Percussing, percussing the abdomen, sure. It might sound duller. Don't worry about it. This really is irrelevant to what we're going to do. Um, they have to have a whole lot of free blood in their abdomen or fluid of some sort to be dull. Um, obviously, solid organs like the liver are going to make it duller, but no need to get hung up on um, percussion. We normally don't have a 
stable enough environment, quiet and all that, for us to be able to adequately percuss a patient in the field. Palpation is very important uh, when you're assessing your abdominal complaint patients. But it's notable if your patient has a complaint of pain that you always start in the area furthest from the, pa uh, from the complaint of pain. When palpating the abdomen, use one hand. Don't use two hands. Don't be uh, palpating both sides of the abdomen because then if you find discomfort, which side was it? Was it the right or hand or the left hand that caused it? So always palpate with one hand in the on the abdomen and work. Um, I recommend a clockwise manner, but it makes no difference. Um, I just like that in my head as a um, consistency to make sure I don't miss anything but always st start as far away from the area of discomfort. First, ending at the discomfort. You're gonna note anything that seems like a pulsating mass or a particular hardness that you weren't anticipating, distension, look for rigidity or discomfort of some sort, but also look for what's called rebound tenderness. Is when you place your hand in the abdomen, press down, there may be some discomfort, but then when you remove your hand, they sh ex um, exclaim that there's significantly more discomfort, and that's rebound tenderness. And that indicates peritonitis or an irritation or inflammation of the peritoneal lining in the abdomen. So this is a uh, this will indicate like a generalized infection in their abdomen, which is life threatening. All right, so um, let's talk a little about pain. All right, we got visceral, parietal, somatic, and referred. What do we know about these? This is your chance to talk back, all right? What do we know about these types of pain? And what about somatic? Anybody got thoughts on somatic? Those were good de descriptions. Yes, somatic tends to be very localized following a nerve track or something like that. So if you have a inflamed spleen or you have an inf irritated appendix or whatever, the pain localized to that one spot, that is somatic. Very direct, pinpoint localized pain. Visceral, I like to think of as deeper pain, as that uh, if you hear the word visceral used in literature or something like that, it normally t means something that's very uh, deep or gut-wrenching or something like that. Um, visceral pain is caused by hollow organs. Um, when you have uh, gastric distress, uh, you got diarrhea and all that kind of stuff, and you have that cramping, gnawing pain in your lower abdomen, that is visceral pain. And it comes in waves of con of contraction as the as the muscles of the um, GI tract contract and relax and contract and relax. That's visceral pain. So good good description there. Uh, deep hollow organ pain. Uh, parietal pain doesn't always play as big of a role in. Um, well, it can in our. Um, a GI assessment, but that's where you're going to have like your peritonitis. The um, it's going to be more diffuse. Now, somatic pain, I already kind of mentioned that. Referred pain. Referred pain has to do with the nerve tracts that run and innervate our um, GI organs or organs within our abdomen and the fact that those nerve tracts run parallel adjacent to other nerve tracts within the body. That means when the area that causes your gallbladder to hurt or the nerves that service your gallbladder happen to be right next to nerves that um, activate or run through the area of your shoulders. So if you have gallbladder pain, you may end up with right shoulder pain because those two nerves are right next to each other and your brain is not is struggling to differentiate. The same as if you have splenic injuries with pain in your spleen, you may have left shoulder pain. So left upper quadrant abdominal pain 
could be related to a spleen issue causing left shoulder pain, which could mimic the left-sided chest and shoulder pain that we would see with a heart attack, just like right upper quadrant pain could be a gallbladder attack causing right shoulder pain. So these are some of these mimics that we're going to look for. I would say that your gallbladder and your spleen are, and so causing right shoulder and left respectively, are the most common uh, referred pains that you're going to need to be familiar with. So there's your uh, descriptions, um, which I believe was read to us a moment ago. All right. Uh, we already talked about rebound tenderness and the life threat there. All right. Sebaces, bowel distension, aneurysms, cancerous tumors. Yep. I think pretty sure I said all those things before. Oh, boy. Okay. Orthostatic signs. Remember, when you're evaluating for orthostatic, you want that 20-beat increase in pulse rate or that 20-millimeter uh, uh, mercury drop in systolic or 10 drop in diastolic. So that's what we're looking for. 20 beat increase in heart rate, 20 point drop in uh, systolic blood pressure. Don't have this yet, uh, but the day is coming. We will see ultrasounds in the pre hospital environment um, probably not too far away. Um, some departments actually have fast. Uh, ultrasounds uh, already on their trucks where they can look for free abdom uh, free blood within the abdomen for uh, trauma patients. Very useful to identify at least the presence of some form of internal bleeding um, and have more than just simply a suspicion of it. All right. Um, while I do see what it says here on that PowerPoint, um, the I anticipate from some of the other stuff I've read more recently that we will see ultrasounds in the future. All right. Yep, 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 yep. Don't think we need to get into that too much. All right. So when we're treating our patients who are complaining of abdominal discomfort, don't let them eat or drink anything. We don't want to add to the potential of nausea and vomiting. We don't want to uh, have anything in their GI tract if we can help it, if they have to go to surgery. And we... We don't know yet what the cause is. So for example, if it was a bowel obstruction or something, giving allowing them to eat or drink would only complicate the issue further. Uh, there has been a lot of different opinions about the use of pain medications and the treatment of pain related to abdominal uh, emergencies over the years. For example, when I was in paramedic school, you did not ever treat abdominal pain. Abdominal pain needed to be untreated until identified the origin and, you know, through doctor's diagnosis because it was thought that the pain medications would mask a lot of the assessment findings and make it more difficult for the doctor to identify. Plus, if there was bleeding associated, it could result in a reduction of um, or of blood pressure, you know, complicating the problem. If your patient was having some form of a stomach or an intestinal uh, ulcers or irritation using anti-inflammatories like Tordol would simply um, aggravate that further. So these were a lot of the reasons we didn't use pain medication or we were taught not to give pain medications over the years. Now with newer treatment guidelines and better assessment uh, tools, you know, through CT scans and ultrasounds and blood tests and uh, such like that in the available more readily in the ER, we are not relying on the patient's complaints as much to be able to identify the underlying cause problem. So it is appropriate in some circumstances to treat abdominal pain when it's severe. Morphine, you should be careful with. It has a big impact. It can have a greater impact on blood pressure if there's a ruptured organ or any form of bleeding. Uh, Ketolorac, Tordol, same kind of issue I mentioned. 
it can cause irritation to the GI tract. So it may you, you want to think about what's the condition here. Um, fentanyl, it's short acting. It wears off before we get to the by the time we get to the hospital. So even if the doctor needs the pain to be present to assess, it's, it'll be there. Uh, more uh, fentanyl seems to be a really good option for a patient in severe abdominal distress. Um, you know, somebody has got like pancreatitis or um, even to a certain extent, a gallbladder attack, append acute appendicitis. These can be extremely painful conditions and that uh, can be easily managed with fentanyl. All right, what ma nausea medications might we use? Well, Zofran, um and promethazine normally come to mind first i've not seen i've yet to see an ambulance that carried hydralazine or excuse me hydroxazine um so i don't know that we'll see that very often but diphenhydramine can be mixed with your promethazine especially uh to be very effective uh in controlling nausea what's the difference between zofran and pro uh and fenugrin which on, dos on Dancitron and uh, Promethazine. What's the difference between those drugs? What do you guys know and what's your experience told you? There is some concern. Mostly at this moment, it's related to there not being enough evidence. However, there are starting to see some reasons to be concerned that uh, Zofran should not be used in a pregnant woman, even though it's still one of the most commonly prescribed anti-nausea medications for pregnant women. So, yep, that's good info there. What else do we know? What else have we learned about these drugs so far? It's going to take a lot higher doses to do that, but yes. So, Zofran was initially invented or you know synthesized however you want to say it in order to treat the nausea that was the result of chemotherapy it was intended for the severe nausea associated with cancer treatment so it works in the brain to basically uh, suppress the sense uh, the receptors in the brain that are going to recognize nausea or would have been activated aggravated by the chemotherapy so this can be very effective for chemo patients. It can also be very useful for patients who have not vomited yet, who are feeling nauseous, but not actu have not actually vomited. Zofran, in my personal experience, I don't want to say it's my opinion or whatever, but in my experience, Zofran doesn't always work well when the patient has already started vomiting. I have had multiple patients, they were already vomiting. I administer Zofran and they still vomited again. Fenugrin on the other side. Fenugrin is a H2 receptor blocker. It works in the GI tract. It works in the stomach itself. It act, It functions on the uh, receptors that result in vomiting, that, that cause the vomiting to happen. It, so it essentially stops the um, vomiting at the source. This is why it's far more effective, but it has a lot of side effects. It can make you drowsy. It can have nerve uh, effect in central nervous system concern, or excuse me, peripheral nervous system concerns like um, restless leg syndrome and things like that. It is very uncomfortable to take either via IM or in a direct IV. It is very caustic, so it burns the vein. It is ideally should be diluted and um, my department, we recommend diluting it in 100 milliliters of saline. If you have a 50 milliliter bag or um, if you're giving a small dose and you, even if you were diluted into like a saline flush, that would be I, better than giving it um, in concentrated form. But it can really be irritating to the vein. But once given, it is very, very effective. But when you mix the H1 receptor blocker like diphenhydramine, Benadryl, then you have a very effective control of your nausea on these patients. But diphenhydramine alone is not intended to be used as an anti-emetic, as an anti-nausea or vomiting medicine. 
All right. So oftentimes when we're, this is one of the areas we want to be aware of with abdominal or GI complaints. These patients are very commonly dehydrated, loss of fluids, and so we want to replace that fluid or replenish those lost fluids from NVD, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Isotonic is what we have available to us. Hypotonic solutions are going to cause the cells to swell. Hypotonic solutions have to be given very controlled. And so for that reason, we don't see them in the pre-hospital environment because we don't have the pumps and things to control them uh, on a regular basis. Some places do, but it's not routine. Um, so using hypotonic solutions can cause swelling in the brain and other major side effects. So we should be cautious with those. Hence, most of the time, we're going to give a isotonic solution, like sodium chloride 9.9% .9 or lactated ringers. All right. Um, yeah. If you're giving uh, fluids for hypotension, you know, they actually have already gone as far as hypotension and you have suspicion of hemorrhage, internal hemorrhage or whatever, uh, monitor that pressure, keep it at 90 to 100 milliliters and um, millimeters of mercury. No need to shoot above that with the blood pressure. If you have no reason to suspect internal bleeding and you feel all the fluid loss has been through uh, diarrhea or vomiting, then you're not so worried about the blood pressure and you can uh, restore bl um, fluids uh, to a normal uh, blood systolic blood pressure. These vasoactive medications may be necessary in your some of your septic patients and some, but this is not considered a first line or something you want to look at when treating hypovolemia. This is going to be more for the infection patient where you have to control that infection, um, that uh, vasodilation uh, that's going on. So. Epinephrine or norepinephrine, also known as Levofed, uh, these are very effective medications. Dopamine will be biometabolized into norepinephrine um, by the body, and that's how it works. The doses for epinephrine are going to be 2 to 10 micrograms for most departments, although you can go up to 30 micrograms per minute. It is, does not have to be weight-based. Um, just 2 to 30 micrograms is a very... Uh, common dose range for epinephrine. Dopamine is weight-based, 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, you would do this after the patient has received fluids. All right, um, <clears throat> so those are some just general care practices and recommendations for your um, abdominal complaints. Now we're going to get into some specific conditions. So before that, let's get up and stretch our legs. So gastrointestinal injuries are specific, not injuries, emergencies. Well, let's remember which chapter I'm in. All right. So I would say um, cholecystitis is probably one of the most common injury or uh, emergencies that you're going to respond to simply because it's associated with so much pain and is often confused for heart attacks. <laughs> but here are a few of those points that you want to look for that'll help distinguish it. Because the gallbladder, as we said before, <clears throat> stores bile from the liver and is released during uh, when we consume fatty meals in order to help emulsify the fats. If their patient has gallstones or inflammation of the gallbladder, anytime they eat a fatty meal and which would stimulate the release of that uh, bile, the, the gallbladder will be irritated and um, the pain will happen. You still have the gallbladder attack. So look at what have they eaten. Uh, we'll see this very commonly after eating a fatty meal. Um, however, an interesting example of this is when women are pregnant and with the movement of the uterus and the dislos, um, the movement of all the other interabdominal organs and all that, even after pregnancy, they can be at an increased risk of gallbladder attacks or gallbladder problems due to stones getting uh, stuck in uh, the common bile duct or in, um, 
blocking the pancreatic duct or something like that. And so these conditions will, res uh, I don't say result in, can predispose the woman to having gallbladder attacks uh, during pregnancy or after pregnancy. Uh, so generally people who have gallstones or uh, limited or gallbladder issues will have to learn which foods to avoid and things along those lines. Now, um, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, yeah, I think we'll come back to gall, gallbladder conditions. Let's see, hypovolemia, it's like with anything else. I mentioned vomiting and diarrhea earlier. The big issue to con be concerned with when you have a patient vomiting a lot or diarrhea it is how that fluid loss is going to affect their pH balance, but also their electrolyte balance. If a patient is vomiting a whole lot of a whole lot and they're not keeping anything down, they will be low on water, but they will also be low on all their electrolytes because they won't have been absorbing them. And their pH will be thrown off because they aren't absorbing that acid. So they will become metabolic alkalotic. Whereas a patient who is having a lot of diarrhea, they will be losing water and electrolytes. Uh, so they'll have low that, but they'll be metabolic acidosis because they're absorbing these stomach acids, but not the water that was associated with it. Um, so that's where you're going to have some of those imbalances. All right. Um, GI bleeding. It's a good point here. It's a symptom. It's not a disease. There's a number of different things that will result in GI bleeds, whether we're talking about peptic ulcers, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, um, esophageal varices, um, hemorrhoids, numbers of different GI bleeds causes. So how do we know what's causing it? Well, let's first, let's identify where it's coming from. Upper GI bleeds, dark tarry stools, melana, because this blood was mixed with the stomach acids resulting in that dark tarry stool. Um, the lower GI bleeds, this is going to be down to the rectum um, and around the anus and in the uh, lower large intestines sigmoid colon and such like that, you're going to have bright red blood in the stool uh, because here the blood has not been uh, digested. It hasn't been through the enzymatic process from the pancreas and from the stomach acids. And so it's basically in its original state. It's still just blood. So uh, you'll see that bright red blood in their stool. Now, obviously, if the patient is vomiting uh, blood, um, and which would often look like coffee ground emesis, that's going to indicate a very upper GI bleed, you know, such as gastric ulcer, peptic ulcer disease, or esophageal varices. So, uh, fluids, the bleeding may still be active, so don't um, underestimate the concern for excessive fluid resuscitation and mon managing the shock for that reason. So here are some of our causes. I already mentioned these. Uh, varices. Um, all right, so Mallory Weiss tear. I didn't mention that earlier. This is where the esophagus tears free from the stomach at the cardiac sphincter. Um, this is generally caused by excessive vomiting. Um, you'll see this with uh, people who have drank too much alcohol and have been vomiting excessively from that but you can also see this related to food poisonings and other like uh, noroviruses um, so basically any form of gi distress cancer can cause gi bleeds uh, again it's you know not the most common and then the dilated veins which is really frankly varices um, from the liver disease. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, can cause bleeding in the esophagus because the stomach acids uh, regurgitate upwards into the esophagus, burning the lining of the esophagus, creating ulcers. So what are you going to have? Well, you'll have uh, melana, bloody stool. You're also going to have hematemesis, which is bloody vomit, and you might have, um, which often looks like coffee grounds. And then you could have gr uh, vomit with gross blood, which would just be 
vomiting blood, depending on the severity of the uh, or and the origin of the bleeding. So you want to look through that. Uh, stomach is going to be exactly the same as the intestines, same kind of things. Uh, small intestines. Uh, you may have, if it's in the, duod the duodenum, you may have some uh, bloody vomit, but that's less common. You're moving towards mostly your uh, melena and maybe your hematemesis. <clears throat> uh, large intestine and rectum hematochesia you're not going to ha the blood was never exposed to the enzymes of the small intestine or the acid of the pancreas so you're not going to uh, have those symptoms all right uh varices so remember i was talking about the uh hepatic portal vein and how the ve the vessels from the GI tract wrap around the esophagus before going into the liver. Well, when the liver has uh, diseased, is diseased and has reduced blood flow, blood backs up in that hepatic portal vein. This results in a swelling of the veins and the vessels are wrapping around the esophagus. And those uh, vessels, when they swell, they'll start to bulge, kind of like an aneurysm towards or inwards towards the esophagus. Patients will complain of actually feeling them in their throat, like they're feeling like something stuck in their throat kind of a thing, um, or that there's pressure. But the big concern here is if they uh, eat something or if they bulge too much they split but then they eat something like a cracker that they didn't that they didn't soften or a chip and it rips it or they vomit and it uh, they increase pressure or even coughing you know even like a the pressure caused by a heavy cough could cause those varices to rupture resulting in a whole lot of blood uh, loss in a very short period of time um, they will be vomiting blood uh, for the friends of mine that have run these calls in their most extreme forms it looks like the exorcist or something out of a horror movie it's just blood everywhere hep c is very is very common the cause um, but cirrhosis of the liver from alcohol um, damage is also uh, can also result in this uh, but for, frankly any form of hepatitis can result in this so the jaundice, the anorexia, the pruritus, the abdominal pain, the fatigue, all of these symptoms are identical to liver failure or hepatitis and liver disease because that's what those are. All right. So it's esophageal varices are not their, um, they are not their own disease. They are a side effect of another disease. So. All right, what are you going to do? Well, there's nothing we can do to stop the bleeding, so you're going to want to um, suction the airway, keep the airway clear as much as possible, reduce vomiting as much as possible, um, fluid management if possible, that kind of a thing. The hospital is going to work on trying to control them. They're going to have to surgically control them. In fact, there's a situation where they use... Um, an inflatable balloon that, that's kind of like one of those party balloons that they can twist into animals, you know, for lack of a better description, but they insert that down the esophagus and inflate it to call, to apply direct pressure to the, um, to the bleeding of varices until they can go in it with endoscopy and uh, stop the bleeding from that, with that. Hmm. I already mentioned Mallory Weiss syndrome. Not much more we can go on there. Uh, Borov syndrome, um, yeah. I mean, it's not much difference. Um, so. so they were vomiting. Now all of a sudden they have a lot of epigastric abdominal pain. They're vomiting blood and melon and they have bloody stool. Like some unrelated vomiting and now this is happening. Maybe suspect it. All right. Now, in later findings, pneumomediastinum, mediastinitis, septicemia, sep which is sepsis, these kind of conditions might be present as well, but this is going these might, are going to be much later findings. Patients will normally seek help before it gets to that severity. <sighs> All right. Um Yeah. 
Yeah. Fluid resuscitation, maintain airway. That's what you're doing with these. All right, peptic ulcer disease, often thought of to be caused by stress. However, what we've learned now is stress simply reduces our resistance to uh, the bacteria H. pylori, and H. pylori is the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease, result in stomach ulcers. Uh, wears down the uh, mucus lining of the stomach, resulting in the acids of the stomach tearing or eating away at the uh, wall of the stomach creating um, issues. This could be in the stomach or the duodenum and is generally presents with pain a couple hours after eating. You see, if the patient eats or drinks something, they dilute the stomach acids, the acids no longer irritate the wall of the stomach or the duodenum and problem, the discomfort goes away. So this is those people who they don't get um, a heartburn immediately after eating, they get heartburn several hours, uh, four to six hours after eating, uh, and it goes away when they eat again. All right, so of course, uh, burns or trauma can cause this due to the inflammatory process. Alcohol and smoking can also uh, play a role in this as well. There's your description, that gnawing pain disappears after eating. Um, so, What are we gonna do for it? Honestly, recommend that they see their primary care doctor. Um, only in stages where their hematesia or melana, you know, where they have a lot of gross or gross blood in their vomit or urine, cases like that, only in those circumstances do they need uh, EMS transport or, you know, fluid replacements or anything like that. For the majority of times, they're going to treat it with acid, antiacids, and then they may uh, ultimately use some antibiotics to treat the H. pylori infection and try to improve that. Their long-term treatment is going to be focused on lifestyle changes that reduce that problem. So very rarely are we going to need to worry about uh, vital signs and blood loss, but, you know, just monitor for that. All right, uh, GERD. So GERD is, again, another um, condition that gets confused with heart attacks. Patients will uh, complain of chest pain, uh, get epigastric med mediastinal uh, pain in this area here. Well, if that's the case, you want to uh, do a little bit more digging. You know, does the pain happen after eating? Does it happen after eating certain types of foods? Do you notice it to come in waves or is it a constant pain? Uh, cardiac related chest pains tend to be a continuous pain that r increases in significance, whereas um, GERD or acid reflux related pain, heartburn pain, is going to come in waves of intensity. It's going to feel burning or gnawing in the middle of their stomach or in the middle of their chest epigastrum, and it'll feel like it's rising up into their chest and then may recede back down in this wave of pain like that. Um, and that's as the acids are um, moving up the esophagus and causing irritation. <sighs> Hiatal hernia is when the stomach actually protrudes up into through the diaphragm into the chest. Um, this can result in a essentially a gastric bypass. It can create a small pocket that uh, gets trapped above uh, the diaphragm. So you can see the example here with normal where the uh, cardiac sphincter and the diaphragm are aligned, but then in this case you have the hiatal hernia where part of the stomach is above the diaphragm resulting in a <laughs> effectively a lap band. Um, all right, so already mentioned coughing have difficulty swallowing would be with the hernia, the GERD, um, Excuse me, said that wrong. Coughing, difficulty swallowing with GERD, but the hiatal hernia is really only going to be a problem if um, 
the pocket starts to fill with food or acids and can't be cleared, that's where you're going to start having complaints of uh, acid reflux type pain or nausea or in difficulty swallowing or something along those lines. But definitely evaluate these patients for the potential of a heart attack. Do not underestimate the possibility this is a myocardial infarction or cardiac related event and make sure that you have done your 12 leads and your full assessments. All right, you feel like hemorrhoids shouldn't be something we talk about in EMS? I have run that call and patient looked me dead in the eye and said, well, I wouldn't want you to waste your gas, so take me anyway. I'm like, dude, you need to go to the drugstore and get some Preparation H. That's your problem. Now, I'm told that internal hemorrhoids are quite a bit of a problem, um, but external hemorrhoids, while extremely painful, don't really cause near the issue and are much easier to treat. So rectal itching, small mass on the rectum, um, bright red blood in the feces, symptoms of hemorrhoids, cool. Moving on. Anal fissures, uh, yeah, so what causes this? Um, pooping too big? Or something else that's too big? in there i don't know but tearing open the uh anus is kind of the problem here i mean that's what it is an anal fissure you have ripped the anus wide open um sure uh trauma hmm from what uh anal rectal cancer hiv um i honestly would have to research that a little bit more to find the connection or the association between hiv and um anal fissures um Crohn's disease. Okay, so Crohn's disease is a really uh, tough one for the patient because it results in a generalized irritation of their GI tract, both small and large intestines, and a weakening of it, a loss of uh, mucous membrane, so they have uncontrollable diarrhea and bowel movements, and that can lead to forceful desiccation, and uh, I guess that's how it would uh, add to the anal fissures there. Uh, so kind of avoid that maybe by um, adequate fiber in your diets, adequate fluid intake, and um, so yeah, uh, anal gauging. So um, yeah, <laughs> notice point number three under management, do not. Do not do that. So esophagitis, uh, inflammation, mostly caused by reflux. Not a big issue. While they may have difficulty swallowing, um, and they might have uh, some shortness of breath or whatever, it's associated with that painful swallowing and just the pain in general. Make sure that they don't have a um, heart attack. Evaluate them for that. All right, tracheal esophageal fistula. All right, what's a fistula? An opening between two portions of the body or two body parts. So this is one of those cases where your patient is going to... Um, Fistulas can form anywhere, right? We use fistulas for dialysis. They take an artery and a vein, they connect them together, making one big bubble, essentially. Well, a fistula can open between the esophagus and the trachea. And so now when your patient tries to eat food and swallows, the food can go from the esophagus into the trachea. Or if they vomit, the vomit can go from the esophagus into the trachea. There's not really much of a concern with stuff from the trachea going into the esophagus. Not gonna be an issue. Um, as you can see, congenital or acquired, um, congenital is gonna be identified pretty early in life and then acquired you know, as here you can see the problems, medical procedures resulting in it, a tumor, a penetrating trauma caused the two tissues to grow together, to heal together, stuff like that. Pneumonia, as you can imagine, is a big concern there. 
as far as assessment and identification to, for it, suspect maybe if the patient had a tracheostomy, uh, but other than that, it's just not something that you're going to think, oh, you know what? I bet they have a tracheostomy. Like, probably not going to happen. It's going to be one of those things. Why does this patient keep aspirating when they have a trach in place or something? And then it'll be found kind of a thing. Uh, main focus is to ensure, yeah, sure. Okay. Airway. All right, so esophageal strictures and stenosis, this would be uh, maybe because of a hiatal hernia or for some other concern, there's been a um, muscle contraction on the uh, esophagus. Patient just can't swallow. That's your concern. Yeah, moving on. I mean, honestly, there's just not a lot going on with that, so... All right, so here we have some acute inflammatory conditions. This is where you're gonna have your GI distress and things along those lines. All right, so anytime you have an acute inflammation, anytime you have like a GI bug of some sort, whether that's bacterial, like food poisoning or something, um, it can move into the bloodstream. So it can, because the bloodstream and the GI tract are so closely associated and the bloodstream is, is uh, designed to absorb stuff out of the GI tract, infections in the GI tract can lead to sepsis really quick. Uh, just like infections in the kidneys can lead to sepsis really quick. Those are kind of like the two most common causes of sepsis. Um, So peritonitis, inflammation in the peritoneal lining. This can be because of an infection. This can be from trauma. This could be a rupture of the internal organ or just straight up the bacteria have migrated out of the GI tract into um, the peritoneal lining. And yes, sepsis is very common with that. So uh, bored hard abdomen. This is that rigid uh, guarded abdomen. Uh, they're going to be febrile. They're going to have all the signs of uh, infection, inflammation, dehydration. They're not going to want to eat. Um, a lot of abdominal pain, very diffuse abdominal pain with rebound tenderness. Because this is commonly associated with sepsis, fluid management, even vasoactive drugs like... Um, vasopressors, epi, do, dopamine, stuff like that, those may be necessary for the treatment of this patient as well. All right, so cholecystitis and biliary tract. So we mentioned this before. I started mentioned, talking about um, gallbladder issues. Cholangitis, inflammation of the bile duct, cholecystitis, stones within the gallbladder, chole duo uh, docolysis, excuse me, at least one stone in the bile duct, and then cholecystitis is just straight up inflammation. So as you can see, there's a number of different variations here. A calculus cholecystitis, no stones, just infection. Uh, you can also, depending on where the stone in the bile duct gets um, stuck, it can cause a regurgitation in the pancreatic duct and uh, pancreatic juices backing up into the pancreas, causing auto digestion and issues with the pancreas and pancreatitis, which we'll see shortly. So um, here are your five Fs. These are the patients that are most likely to suffer from cholecystitis, infection, um, inflammatory, um, gallbladder issues. So fair being Caucasian, white women are, are white, um, overweight women who are still fertile, who have not, or who are premenopausal and are in their 40s to 50s. Uh, so, which basically means they're getting, um, well, they're still fertile. Once they go through menopause, they're much less likely to have gallbladder issues, especially if they've never had them previously. So look for these five Fs for the abdominal pain. Um, I've run quite a few uh, gallbladder diseases, gallbladder attacks in um, uh, 
black in the black population in the hispanic population it's but it is more predominant in the white population so um here remember these five f's when it comes to identifying this and like i said before it generally arises after the patient has eaten a fatty meal of some sort and uh, has a history of similar condition, the pain will very frequently be referred to the right shoulder. Inflamed uh, gallbladders will have referred right shoulder pain. Um, and one of the diagnostic assessments is the Murphy sign. The Murphy sign is when you have them um, Exhale as much as they can. Um, you know, take a really long breath out, and then you put your finger very, very much mid clavicular, your hand up under the uh, rib cage, mid clavicular line, um, and place your hand really deep in there, as far down, palpate as deep as you can up under that rib cage, and then ask them to take a deep breath. If um, if when they take a deep breath there's a very sudden sharp increase of that pain that is your positive murphy sign that is an indication of um the infl the pressure you've applied coming in contact with that inflamed gallbladder so if you take your you know if everybody was to lean back as far back as you can in the chair you kind of you can't do it when you're bent over but lean far back in your chair stick your hand up under your rib cage or under your partner your neighbor's rib cage or whatever Breathe out, stick your hand out there, and then take a deep breath, and you'll feel the change because the diaphragm will push the liver down, and that's during that process that if they have an inflamed gallbladder, it will cause sharp pain. So try that out. All right, so pain medications would be appropriate. This patient will look pale, cool, diaphoretic. They will feel nauseated. They will feel like they are dying. Uh, many times these get confused with heart attacks. So run the 12 lead, evaluate them for that, but keep that in mind. All right. Um... <laughs> All right, appendicitis. So moving away from the gallbladder down into the right lower quadrant. This is at the base of the ascending colon, right where the uh, ilium connects to the ascending colon is where you have your gall or your uh, appendix. Your appendix is full of, excuse me, immune cells. These, uh, it's like a Peyer's patch. Uh, Peyer's patches are elsewhere in the GI tract, but the, in the immune cells, or excuse me, in the appendix are immune cells that monitor your uh, stuff that comes through the GI tract and looks for bacteria invading organisms and things along those lines. It can become inflamed specifically in patients who are eating low fiber diets. High fiber diets tend to improve or um, reduce the risk of appendicitis. If it becomes infected and inflamed, peritonitis, sepsis, it can rupture, resulting in peritonitis, sepsis, and ultimately death due to the infection. It doesn't generally result in death from um, blood loss, but from the sepsis and the infection. So, uh, early signs. So these are your three stages. Periumbilical pain. This is pain around the umbilicus, pain in the very center of the abdomen. Uh, they may have some nausea, vomiting. Then as it continues to inf get inflamed, the infection grows, becomes ripe. That ripeness results in a very specific right lower quadrant. This is McBurney's point. Um, lower right quadrant pain could be misconstrued for an ectopic pregnancy. In fact, these two go very commonly and get confused with each other, and so you want to rule out both. Um, obviously, if your patient is... A biological male they're not going to have a big concern with um, ectopic pregnancies but it you want to make certain that you've done a thorough assessment there this may be the one where you have the teenage female or something like that and they're like nope nope not pregnant well question them again when their significant other or their parent or something like that is not present make sure that you provide privacy and respect to them in that condition but that is a possibility ectopic pregnancy 
and appendicitis are both life-threatening conditions. However, ectopic pregnancies are far more rapid in their development as far as um, the blood loss and all that. So much bigger concern there. Interesting thing is, if the patient has had a um, uh, ruptured appendix, once the appendix ruptures, their pain is relieved. Um, to the point where they're not really that concerned about it, but then they start developing the fever and the infection in the sepsis. So watch out for that. This is why that history, when did this start? When did the pain start? What other things have happened? And go through the uh, process. If I remember correctly, dump, uh, Dunphy's sign is a process of um, pain with coughing. Yep. Increased in neuroabdominal pain. The pain gets worse when the patient coughs. That's what I thought. So that's what you're going to look for. Uh, I would re remember Dumpty's sign. Fluids are very important. Anti-nausea and pain medication may be necessary too. These are places where your vasoactive drugs will be necessary. Uh, fluids will be necessary. That kind of a thing. Um, all right, so diverticulitis. This is another, uh, this is a, um, this is a condition specific to the large bowel. So the large bowel has these little pockets or segmentations throughout it, the colon, that are called diverticula. And they, um, when they become weak, they can balloon out or expand out kind of like a uh, aneurysm. And we call those diverticulum. Diverticulosis is just having having these pockets. And uh, diverticulitis is when fecal matter, chyme, and things, bacteria get trapped within that diverticuli and it becomes inflamed and infected. <clears throat> so... Solid stools, low fiber, fiber diets, stool gets trapped. High fiber diets, softer stool, stool moves through the colon without getting trapped. Um, so if it tears it can um, or gets trapped, you get scarring, you get adhesions, you get fistulas. The adhesions are when like the softened, uh, irritated tissue of the colon connects to the soft of uh, the small bowel or the kidney or the bladder. In fact, I had a co-worker whose sigmoid colon developed a adhesion and then a fistula between the sigmoid colon and the bladder. So fecal matter was transferring from the colon directly into the bladder and he was passing feces in his urine. Which is kind of when he realized, oh, this is a problem. Incidentally for him, he had a history of rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune disorder. He was treating it with Humira, which is a biologic um, for the treatment of RA and Crohn's disease. Well, it tends to soften the lining on the tissue of the GI tract, and that's what led to the production of the, um, the fistula and the development of that fistula. As you can imagine, associated with that was severe sepsis and things like that. So, um, diverticulitis, as you can see, there could be constipation, could be diarrhea, could be any number of things, wide variety, lower abdominal pain with infection symptoms, not normally associated with uh, nausea or vomiting. For the pre-hospital environment, very little that we're going to do. Um, all right. Pancreatitis. Getting into another realm here, but let's take a quick break. All right. Pancreatitis. So what do we know about the pancreas? Tell me about the pancreas. We talked about it earlier. So what do you recall? What do we know about it? Ooh, 
So it has endocrine and exocrine functions. Um, very very uh, significant. Now there are other organs like the kidneys or you know have they secrete renin and things like that. So, yeah. um, but very very important distinction. It's got both endo and exocrine. What are the endocrine functions of the pancreas? Yep, and uh, somatostatin is another uh, hormone secreted by the glu the pancreas. But also, what are somebody else? What are the exocrine functions of the pancreas? Cheyenne, you've been hiding behind that uh, profile picture. Maybe, uh, maybe somebody in Mississippi. What are the exocrine functions of the pancreas? Do we need somebody to say what's exocrine? Yeah, the production of digestive enzymes. So the exocrine function of the pancreas is to produce enzymes. What, somebody else, what are those enzymes going to work on? What, what are they used for? What's the body use those enzymes for? Where do think about where do those enzymes go and what do they function on? Let's go more specific. Yes, they are used for breaking down food, but which parts of food? So lipids, which are fats, are going to be bought. Um, emulsified by the bile salts and from the bile, not from the enzymes of the pancreas. Um, that's a lipid. Um, so the pancreatic enzymes are going to work predominantly on your, my brain doesn't work, carbohydrates and proteins. Proteins, it, basically breaking them down into the amino acids. So taking polysaccharide carbohydrates and then breaking them into disaccharides and monosaccharides like glucose, or um, and then taking the proteins and breaking like from the meat that we eat and such and breaking them down into um, individual amino acids that can be absorbed into our bloodstream through, um, through the villi of the uh, small intestines. So, because of these functions, the pancreas is incredibly important to our body, both for the endo and exocrine functions. Without it, we wouldn't be able to absorb any nutrients, for, pretty nearly any nutrients from our blood, food, or at least not from whole food. We'd have to only have a liquid diet of um, that's already basically just sugar, water, and mineral and uh, vitamins and minerals kind of a thing. So. Um, when injuries happen to the pancreas, when the injury, or when the pancreas becomes inflamed, when trauma happens to it, infection or something like that, and that pancreatic duct is blocked and there's a restriction of the enzyme juices from flowing from the pancreas, that will backlog into the pancreas, causing further inflammation, where it leads to what's called autodigestion. These are when the enzymes produced by the pancreas start breaking down the carbohydrates and the proteins found in the tissue of the pancreas. Because remember, we, our body uses those carbs and um, proteins to build our our tissues, our cell tissues, our, our, our tissues cells. So when those pancreatic juices cannot make it to the small intestines, it can cause significant problems in that uh, for that patient. So this is why they say pancreatitis, a very painful disease, definitely treat it with pain medication. Pancreatic cancer is considered to be one of the most miserable ways to die. Um, 
Pancreatitis could be episodic, meaning they have recurrent pancreatic attacks, or they could be just a single episode once. <clears throat> So sharp pain in the epigastric area. Because the ep pancreas lies in the retroperitoneal space against the spine, you'll often hear them complain about it radiating to the back. So one of the things that you will um, find associated with it, excuse me, no, not associated. One of the things that it'll mimic is an aortic aneurysm, a triple A's and such like that. So you would want to rule that out, look for that pulpate, pulsating mass and things like that. But also notice that it's an infection. Pancreatitis will be associated with fever, could have muscle spasms due to an abnormal uh, chemistry balance in the blood. Uh, you might have nausea and vomiting associated with it due to the inability to digest the food properly and the lack of uh, pancreatic enzymes. So whereas the fever, muscle spasms, and nausea and vomiting are rarely associated with the AAA. All right, so here's pancreatitis when it has resulted in a rupture or bleeding of the hemorrhaging of the pancreas. So you can see Cullen sign and Gray Turner's, which is which in this picture? <sighs> yep, Cullen's is one word, one umbilicus, Gray Turner's, two flanks, two words. All right. Um, pain medication may be appropriate, uh, is very likely going to be appropriate for these patients. Fluids, if you see contusions or swelling, or not swelling, but uh, signs of shock and things like that. All right. Uh, chronic inflammatory, more inflammatory conditions. So, IBS, irritable bowel disease, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, this can get into coli ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Ulcerative colitis is a irritation, inflammation of the lining of the colon, whereas Crohn's is an inflammation of the lining of the entire GI tract. So both of these have very similar uh, presentation, not presentations, but uh, pathos. It's just ulcerative colitis is just the colon, whereas Crohn's is the entire GI tract. And both place the patient at risk of cancer because these irritations and inflammations of the lining can uh, result in enzymes and acid and bacteria becoming coming in contact with the walls of the GI tract, which results in cancer forming, tumors. So here you go. Ulcerative colitis, general inflammation of the colon. Um, your age groups, 15 to 25, and then a grand in 55 to 65. That's kind of where you're, where it tends to present in those two age categories. So bloody diarrhea, frequent mucus discharge, hemochesia, bright red blood, abdominal pain, um, feeling of rectal fullness all the time. This is because of the weakening of the rectum and the thinning of the wall. They may have skin lesions. A lot of skin problems are related with GI tract issues. So uh, that's one of the examples there. Unless the patient has a rupture or is severely dehydrated, there's not a lot we're going to do for ulcerative colitis, you see. Um, these patients normally are just looking for a bathroom all the time, unfortunately. All right, Crohn's disease. Again, this is where your um, the ulcerative colitis has expanded to the entire GI tract, very commonly caused by autoimmune disorders. This is um, this can leave a lot of scarring and damage on the tissue, uh, which could lead to bowel obstructions, can lead to ruptures. Uh, can lead to fistulas and adhesions. So a lot of a lot larger issues associated with Crohn's. Um, one of the big issues, another big issue with Crohn's is due to this diarrhea and this inflammation, the patient will have reduced nutritional absorption. So they will have that malnourished anorexic look even though they are eating, but they will also have a reduced appetite due to the constant GI uh, pain and nausea and all that. So, 
Uh, fluid resuscitation, nausea and pain control will be very important. These patients are likely dehydrated. Um, so even if you're not expecting fluid loss or uh, blood loss or anything, fluid replacement would be helpful for that dehydration. So, um, all right, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, we're probably somewhat familiar with it. Notice the definition of IBS is very vague. Most requirements have a minimum of three days a month of having pain three days a month for at least three months in a row. Not a lot, not a lot of requirement there. Um, so bowel pain receptors, they feel pain more readily in their stomach. They have very active, smooth muscles. So if they are, um, they'll eat something and it'll pass through them very uh, quickly. Um, so it's like I eat, eat a meal and then an hour later they're in the bathroom because it's just gone right through them. You'll often hear uh, descriptions of uncontrollable bowels, uh, sudden urge that's unavoidable and things like that. Now, while there is a psychiatric connection between psychiatric disorder connection between IBS, there's I've read some really interesting suggest um, studies and uh, such that point to the possibility that the IBS and the irritation of the bowel is what creates the psychiatric disorder, not the psychiatric disorder leading to the IBS. So So we are recording. So uh, yeah, stress, uh, eat food, things like this can trigger IBS, um, can be a real pain in the butt, ha ha ha, when you work in EMS, um, especially when you're in the middle of a transport and your body decides that, you know what, I think we need to go to the bathroom. So, um, yeah, most of our care is supportive is fluid resuscitation, possibly nausea medications, but really um, not much pre-hospital is going to do for them. Um, all right, so here are some conditions like food poisonings and such that will be acute um, inf infections, gastroenteritis, stuff like that. Um, uh yeah so this is where um because of the infection because of the vomiting or something uh gi contents are lost into the peritoneum resulting peritonitis and sepsis so these are your most common causes of gastro acute gastroenteritis or you know what they call stomach bugs whether that's a virus norovirus and rotavirus being the big ones um or the uh, parasites, so protozoan, um, cryptosporidium, uh, cyclospora, and then you have your various bacteria, food um, related, food poisoning related bacteria. As you'll notice, almost all of these, um, Escherichia coli or E. coli, <clears throat> Klebsiella pneumoniae, Enterobacter, Campylobacter geogeni. Vibrio chloro, cholera, Shingella, Salmonella, and Clostridium difficile. All of those are enterobacter, enterobacters. Um, these are bacteria that are common to the GI tract. Um, so um, this is can easily be avoided by good hand hygiene and good food preparation. While these bacteria exist in other areas, you know, in life, they are, these are where you're gonna get them from like uh, dirty water or contaminated food or um, poor cooking uh, preparation or more commonly, uh, unclean uh, food processing. So whether like when the, uh, meat was being processed and the animal was originally being uh, butchered and cleaned out and all that, that there was contamination there from GI contents and such. I thought it was norovirus. Norovirus was a much more common GI tr track issue. Um, 
but I don't recall. There's been several different uh, situations with that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I do believe they were able to determine that it was the, it, yeah, it was the virus and it wasn't the food. It wasn't a um, foodborne bacteria or anything like that. Yeah, could be several hours, several days before you see the symptoms. For certain bacterial infect, foodborne bacterial infections, it can actually take several weeks because the bacteria has to um, colonize and reproduce and come to a pathogenic load before you start having symptoms. <sniffs> Normal symptom, or here's your common symptoms. We Everybody knows what a GI bug is. So what are we going to do for them? Same as anything else. Teach them about safe food and water use. Avoid contamination ourselves. Uh, one of the ones that we'll see a lot is the C. diff issue associated with recent hospital stay or um, heavy antibiotic use. Maybe they have another associated infection. They're using antibiotics. The antibiotics kill off all their intestinal flora. C. diff, which uh, is a very aggressively growing bacteria, starts to grow back out of proportion to the other GI con, um, bacteria and so spreads to portions of the GI tract it's not normally common to and that's what leads to your C. diff uh, diarrhea and such like that. Hmm. Very distinct odors associated with that. All right, rectal abscesses. Um, yeah it is it's an infection it's a clogged duct from probably the bartholin glands in the rectum that no those are in the um vagina never mind uh what are they in the rectum oh what's the name <sighs> dang it blanking on it i hate it when i do that Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, all right. So, uh, not really that relevant, but nothing you're going to do for it. It's just kind of like, oh, something's stuck in there. No, you didn't stick anything in there. Well, okay, probably an abscess. Stick something in there. We're getting to that section. We haven't we have, we haven't got that far yet. It's here. It, <laughs> yep. Well, you normally with those patients, you just you walk in. They're leaning on the uh, mantle at, with this very um, sheepish look on their face, obvious discomfort, and you're like, "So what's going on?" And they're like, "Just don't ask. Just take me to the hospital." And you're like, gotcha. Was it worth it? So, all right. Moving to liver disease. No, I brought up liver earlier. We talked about um, hepatic portal vein issues and such like that. Remind me again, what are the conditions or what does the liver do? Why is the liver so important in our body? Okay, detoxifies our bloodstream um, from most of the medications and toxins and chemicals that we ingest. Do what? Mm-hmm.
So another big function of the liver would be a uh, the ability to produce bile for the absor absorption of um, dietary fats, and then it plays a big role in the production of coagulate coagulation factors and blood clotting. So liver failure is going to be shown with portal hypertension. Uh, this is where you have the swelling of the esophageal varices. You might have a bit of a JVD. You'll probably end up with some abdominal ascites and such like that. There will be a reduced clotting ability, so the patient will bruise very easily. And then you'll have an inability to detoxify the blood. What this will mean is a patient will uh, consume a toxin, and that toxin will no longer have its normal metabolic half-life because there's nothing to break it down. So where, you know, for example, alcohol, you think, well, you drink alcohol and so much of it will be reduced every hour until it's all gone. Well, a patient who has liver cirrhosis, severe cirrhosis of the liver, and doesn't have the ability to detoxify alcohol from their blood, they will drink one beer and that alcohol will never leave. It will be a constant circulation or extremely long process of removal of that or detoxification of that alcohol because their liver doesn't um, process it. So it's uh, a common misconception is these patients who are chronic alcoholics creating cirrhosis, alcohol-induced cirrhosis and all that, who continue to drink, they will now get um, inebriated off of far less alcohol than, than you would have expected. You're like, well, somebody like you is a professional drinker. You know, you should be able to handle more than just one Colt 45. Well, apparently that's all it takes to get them heavily inebriated simply because they can't process it out anymore. So here's some of the symptoms, early signs, the anorexia, because the lack of liver function, they don't want to, um, they're just not hungry and such like that, skin conditions, the itching, puritis, and then, right. Here shows the later findings. So this is where you're starting to have icteric conjunctiva and a, um, which is a buildup of bilirubin in the blood. Bilirubin is the byproduct of your uh, clotting factors func and development and, th and the hemoglobin breakdown. So when they don't have the liver to function, it starts building up as a toxin that turns your eyes yellow and your skin yellow and things like that. Acolic stools, these are gray or white colored stools that float because they don't have any fat or because they have a high level of fat in them because the liver wasn't able to digest the dietary fats because or the body wasn't able to digest dietary fats because the liver couldn't make bile. Ascites is that buildup of fluid in the um, abdomen. The enlarged liver can be palpated below the rib cage on the upper right quadrant. So where we were talking about Murphy's sign earlier, you can actually feel the liver extending below the edge of the rib cage due to its um, enlargement. They'll have dark urine because a lot of the toxins that were supposed to be metabolized by the liver are now going to be um, lost in the urine and filtered out through the, uh, the renal system. So aminotransferase, alkaline, albumin, bilirubin, these are all tests of liver function. Um, another thing that they're going to look for is your, their ammonia levels. So monitor the patient's ammonia levels um, and find out if they have, um, because that's one of the toxins that are a common side effect of um, use of proteins to produce called aminotransferase. It is the function that where proteins are used to make glucose and that side effect produces, or the side effect of that is um, ammonia. And that ammonia has to be removed from the blood by the liver. If the liver doesn't isn't functioning properly, you're gonna have a buildup of um, ammonia in the blood. And we've talked about that earlier, how we have hepatic encephalopathy, where that buildup of ammonia in the blood causes a ammonia shift into the cells of the brain. Then the cells start to swell, the brain cells swell, causing altered mental status confusion and things like that. Medication should definitely be given at a low dose range because of the toxicity. The patient can't detoxify it. So shoot for the low end doses, not the high end doses. Um, 
<laughs> and here's the hepatic encephalopathy I was just talking about. All right. Um, yeah. Confusion, impaired reasoning, tremor, bradykinesia, attention deficit. These are all symptoms of encephalopathy. Yep, rule out any other potential side effect or causes of altered mental status, monitor blood sugar, look for trauma, overdose, chemicals of various types and things like that. All right, so obstructive conditions, things that will be uh, blocking. All right, so esophageal obstructions, you'll find these in kids sticking things in their mouth, choking on a toy or something like that. Uh, somehow, some reason, young men have an obsession with getting things stuck in their butt. So, apparently, rectal obstructions tend to occur in young men. So, bowel obstructions, all right? So, this is in between the esophagus and the rectum, you know. This is the rest of the population. Um, basically, the inability to move digestive material or um, di intestinal contents through the digestive tract perilous paralysis or um changes in the intestine so paralysis the funny thing here is is almost always caused by inappropriate laxative use right people who think that they are not passing stool appropriately will use laxatives but the funny so they use the laxatives they pass a lot of stool and then they have several days in which they don't pass stool and they're like, oh no, I'm constipated again. No, you just cleared the whole track out. You've got to wait for it to build back up. But they think they're constipated, so they take more laxatives. The primary ingredient in most over-the-counter laxatives is magnesium. You know, whether you're milk magnesia, mag citrate, stuff like that. Most of them are magnesium based. When you take these laxatives excessively, you're absorbing a lot of magnesium into your body and into your um, bloodstream. Well, magnesium is a muscle, a smooth muscle relaxer. It's a muscle relaxer of all muscles, but specifically smooth muscle relaxers. So uh, the GI tract, which is smooth muscle, lots of magnesium exposure, it stops peristalsis. It stops contracting. So they've actually constipated themselves, giving themselves Paral paralytic ileus or par paralysis of the intestines because of the laxatives that they were trying to use to stop the um, constipation they thought they had. So misunderstandings and misuse of laxatives are a very common cause of bowel obstructions. So I already mentioned uh, upper esophageal sphincter um, obstructions for kids. Older adults who have issues with uh, controlling the sphincters and controlling the peristalsis of the esophagus due to maybe a stroke or something can result in esophageal obstructions as well. Common signs and symptoms. As far as the upper esophageal, we probably won't remove anything from the esophagus unless it's very proximal and com causing compression on the trachea but uh these are some area some options the interesting thing there is with the foley catheter they'll insert that down the esophagus beside the obstruction then inflate the balloon after it's passed the obstruction and then use it to basically hook the um obstruction and drag it back up the esophagus Um, uh, small bowel obstructions, adhesions, post-operative based because they were trying to treat another condition resulted in tissue adhesions, scar tissue building up and creating the obstruction. These patients will present with pain, possibly a alteration of bowel movements. Something to remember with uh, bowel obstructions. There may be a bowel obstruction, but that doesn't mean they won't have a bowel movement. Oftentimes, the loose, watery stool will still make its way around the obstruction, and so they will still say, oh, yeah, I had a bowel movement, but it was diarrhea, and so they won't think that it's a bowel obstruction, even though that's the cause. So consider that just because they said they had a bowel movement, find out more about it. That may still indicate the bowel obstruction. Bowel obstructions 
generally aren't life-threatening, but they, as long as they are relieved, however, when um, they are not relieved and they continue to back up, it can result in aspiration, vomiting, including vomiting of uh, fecal matter. Easily, large bowel obstructions are fairly easily corrected. Uh, rarely, if it's a not, you know fecal matter and such like that, it rarely requires surgery. Foreign objects, that's a different story. All right, so abdominal wall hernias. These are where the muscles of the abdominal wall has separated and a portion of the intestines are per bulging or protruding out. Here's two examples of uh, ileal hernias um, or iliac hernias. Uh, they could be periumbilical or you know around the umbilicus, and you could also have them down in the scrotal area, though we normally aren't gonna look for those. Here's Pre, uh, predisposing factors, um, obesity, standing, you know, uh, jobs that require you to stand for a long time, heavy lifting, that straining with the bowel movement, holding pressure in your abdomen when you lift, and COPD because of the increased intrathoracic pressure and intra-abdominal pressure and coughing. So epigastric, hiatal, and then umbilical, inguinal. I said ileum. It was inguinal, I'm sorry. And then femoral. So here's your four types. Reducible. It pops out. You can pop it back in with your finger. Not really a concern. Probably doesn't even hurt. Should it get treated? Eventually, yes. But at the moment, it's really not a big concern. Incarcerated is when it's... Um, the hernia has happened, but it's trapped and you can't push the tissue back in. You can't re reduce it. That's starting to become a bit more of a concern. Strangulated is when fecal matter or chyme or something, depending on where it's from, is stuck in there and now it's becoming inflamed and you're having a loss of blood flow due to the muscles contracting around it and things like that. So that creates a bit more of an issue. That can actually be considered a surgical emergency. Incisional hernias, that's just, they had surgery there, maybe like a, uh, um, this is very rarely, but it can happen, a uh, cesarean, but normally some other form of abdominal surgery, and that results in the hernia developing through the incision. And then, of course, that could be anywhere the incision is. <laughs> rarely are... Abdominal wall hernia is something you or I are going to have to heal, uh, deal with or do anything for, but it's one of those things people will call you and they're like freaking out because it's one in the morning and all of a sudden they've got this bump in their stomach and they're like, what the crap? And you're like, dude, stop smoking the weed. You're okay. It's just a hernia. Nobody like, man, I thought it was an alien coming out of my stomach. So... All right, rectal foreign body obstruction. Um, it could be something they ate, they swallowed, like especially in kids, swallowing a Lego, swallowing a toy or whatever, passing all the way through their GI tract and now it's stuck and sudden rectal pain uh, with defecation, uh, difficulty defecating or something like, urge to defecate, unable to, or you have the adult or individual, maybe not necessarily an adult, who has decided to stick something up there and now it is stuck. Um, first and foremost, when dealing with these patients, do not attempt to remove the object. I guarantee you, if they stuck it in there, they tried everything they possibly could to remove it before you showed up. They, If they could have come out, they would have gotten it out. So do not attempt to remove it simply because if it's created a suction, um, like for example, like a bottle or some uh, bottle-like uh, structure, if it's created a suction, you could actually prolapse the rectum and uh, or tear it, creating really big issues. If uh, it has sharp edges or something, it might result in tears, further complicating things. Uh, so don't attempt to remove it. Give pain meds if necessary, if it's needed, if it's just mild pain, probably not needed. And then um, when it says be compassionate and non-judgmental, mostly that means don't laugh in front of them and um, don't let them overhear you telling other people about it.
All right, mesenteric ischemia. What does that sound like to you? Tell, talk to me about this. We meant I actually mentioned the mesenteric earlier, so tell me, what does this sound like to you? I know, it's real exciting. We go from foreign body rectal obstructions to mesenteric ischemia. Yeah, something's not getting enough air. So the mesenteric tissue is the membrane that holds all of the intestines to the back, to the spine. Basically suspends the spine or the intestines to the spine and the blood flow through or the blood to the intestines flows through that mesenteric tissue. If you've ever field dressed an animal, if you've ever helped out on a farm with the processing of chickens or cows, deer, pigs, whatever, you'll have noticed that the intestines, while they are a long tube, are actually all connected to a ribbon-like or sheet-like membrane that holds them to the spine of the uh, animal. And that's the mesentery. So mesenteric ischemia is a blood clot in the vessels or in the capillaries of the uh, mesenteric tissue that results in a essentially lack of blood flow to the intestines. So think stroke in the intestines or heart attack or PE in the intestines. While it is a surgical emergency, it is often hard to identify, which basically means by the time they identify it, it's a real big problem. Um, so, and you can see these um, symptoms are extremely benign, like tons of different things could, uh, could have these symptoms. All right, so we've mentioned tumors for every single section, cancerous growths. Um, this is the same in the GI tract. Uh, patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are a much greater risk of having tumors in their GI tract. So um, you would want uh, to consider that one of the big issues that it'll cause is uh, bowel obstructions. Um, so pancreatic uh, tumors, we've already kind of mentioned that. I mentioned pancreatic cancer earlier. It's the same thing. As you can see, uh, no known cause, smoking, diet, hereditary. These are the causes or incidents of them. The anorexia and weight loss is um, associated with the lack of pancreatic juices and enzymes. <laughs> Love how, yeah, this is pretty much a death sentence. These patients will not, uh, or rarely will survive. These are very difficult and painful um, cancer deaths. So they likely will have some form of living will or do not resuscitate and could be on hospice. So be attentive to that possibility with these patients. All right, hepatic tumors, cancer of the liver, so it's almost always with, as you can see, cirrhosis or hepatitis. Not much you're gonna do for it though, it's just a thing. That's why it's here, Pfft, I don't know. All right, so how can we avoid GI distress and GI issues? Kind of everything that I talked about at the beginning that shows a risk, that puts us at increased risk. Um, so long and the short of it, get out of EMS, maybe. Good sources of dietary fiber, and that's it. So, um, 